Hello, and welcome to the second Anatomy and Physiology Journal Club. My name is Laird Sheldahl. I am an a and instructor at Mount Hood Community College in Gresham, Oregon. Today I'd like to discuss some recent publications on the genetics of schizophrenia. This is exciting to me because when I learned about schizophrenia in school, the cause or causes were a complete mystery, and the treatments seemed to have side effects that often did not outweigh the benefits. So these recent studies offer some hope that better treatments could be developed in the future, and better yet, that preventative measures could be developed to stop the disease from even occurring in the first place. My presentation today was inspired by an article in the Genetic Literacy Project, which does a very good job of describing the technology of genomic analysis and the hopes that personalized medicine offer us. It is a summary of research published in 2016 in Nature. I would like to focus on what we have learned in a and class that helps us to understand what is complement component 4 and how it could possibly be involved in the development of schizophrenia. Let's start with schizophrenia. Current theories suggest that schizophrenia develops in a two-step process. The first step occurs when we are tiny little embryos developing inside the uterus. This is when the central nervous system is first growing. It's not hard to imagine that damage to the nervous system at this time could lead to things like schizophrenia, but this is not the time when symptoms of schizophrenia first arise. Typically, that happens much later during our teenage years. And this is a time when the brain is undergoing a different process. Instead of growing rapidly, this time period is characterized more with pruning or the removal of neurons. And in fact, a healthy brain is going to remove about half of the neurons that it grew in the first place. So schizophrenia starts with damage to the developing central nervous system, damage caused by stress, such as the mother experiencing the death of a loved one, or a certain type of infection. But secondly, this damage is uncovered later in life due to excessive pruning of the central nervous system. Now pruning is normal, but too much pruning, specifically in a region called the prefrontal cortex, might lead to schizophrenia. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain involved in short-term memory as well as decision-making. And we learned in anatomy class this was the last part of the brain to undergo maturation. Maturation involves the removal of unneeded neurons, followed by the myelination of some of the neurons that are left. And the prefrontal cortex does this during our teenage years, right around the same time when the symptoms of schizophrenia typically first arise. The question today is, are there any genetic factors that might increase our risk of damage as an embryo, or might lead to too much pruning of the prefrontal cortex when we are teens? For those that have had me for their a and instructor, you might also suspect I'll be asking the question, are there any neuroglia involved in this process? The Nature article looked at the entire genome of a number of people who have schizophrenia and compared it to the genome of people who do not have it and asked the question, were there any genes or more specifically alleles that seem to contribute to the onset of the disease? And what they found was that yes, indeed, there were a large number of genes that seem to increase the risk of people developing schizophrenia. Now, I should be saying that there were a number of single nucleotide polymorphisms involved. If you would like a more accurate rundown on the genetics, please read the Genetic Literacy Project article or the Nature article. I would like to stay a little bit more simplistic and focus on anatomy. And what they found was that there were a number of genes that fell into one of two categories. The first category were mutations in genes that control the development of the nervous system. And this was not surprising given that schizophrenia is a disease affecting the brain. The second category was a little bit more surprising, 
And in fact, the biggest risk factor was a mutation to a gene called C4, which is a component of the complement cascade. Complement is a part of our immune system, a series of proteins floating around in the bloodstream. These proteins, however, do not come into contact with neurons, thanks to the existence of a system called the blood-brain barrier. So how could something in our bloodstream potentially affect the growth and death of neurons in the brain? So C4 is a component of the complement cascade. And complement is a group of 20 or so proteins that floats around in our bloodstream, minding its own business until a foreign invader, such as a bacteria or a virus, shows up. Now, the first step in fighting off that foreign invader is to identify it. And one way that our immune system can identify bad guys is by the fact that they have unique proteins or carbohydrates on their surface known as antigens. And one of the main ways that our immune system can recognize antigens is through the activity of B cells, a type of lymphocyte which can make antibodies, proteins that can be secreted into our bloodstream and stick to these antigens on the surface of the bad goobers. The sticking of an antibody will signal to complement to stop floating around independently and instead come together to form a pore in the membrane of a bacterium. And this allows water to enter into the bad guy. It will then start to swell and it will eventually die through a process of lysis, or more simply put, it explodes due to too much pressure. Now, keep in mind this is happening in the bloodstream or in our connective tissues. B cells and antibodies are not normally found in our central nervous system. The role that C4 plays in the central nervous system is a little bit different. Instead of floating around in our bodily fluids, waiting for antibodies to direct it to attack bacteria, it is instead attached directly to the cell surface of our neurons. Specifically, it can be found on certain dendrites. Dendrites, as you remember, are the receiving ends of information for neurons. And the dendrites that get the most C4 seem to be targeted for pruning or removal. A little bit of dendritic reorganization isn't going to kill this entire neuron. But it's possible that with enough C4, the entire neuron could be targeted for removal. To further understand the role of C4 in the nervous system, we need to go back to the rest of the body and discuss two proteins that we learned about in A and P class. There, we learned about proteins called major histocompatibility complex, of which there were two major flavors, MHC1 and MHC2. MHC1 was found on most of our cells in the body. And when these cells got infected with viruses or bacteria, little bits of those viruses and bacteria could be moved to the surface of the cell and loaded up onto MHC1. And this will help the immune system recognize and fight this infection. MHC2, however, was only found in antigen-presenting cells. These cells can gobble up viruses and bacteria, chew them up into bits, and load those bits on to MHC2. So once antigens have been loaded onto the MHC molecules, they can, in turn, be recognized by the immune system. Antigens on MHC1 are recognized by a type of lymphocyte called a cytotoxic T cell. These cells have a protein called a T-cell receptor on their cell surface, which can recognize specific antigens. And when they do, they will tell the infected cell to undergo apoptosis. Antigens on MHC2 trigger a different response. These are recognized by T-helper cells, another type of lymphocyte. 
These cells also have T cell receptors, which can recognize specific antigens. But when they recognize an antigen, instead of killing the cell, which isn't infected and therefore doesn't need to be killed, instead, these release cytokines, which increase the activity of cytotoxic T cells, the B cells that we learned about on the previous slide, and a number of other white blood cells that are part of the innate defenses, which I haven't talked about at all. This still doesn't tell us where C4 fits into the whole scheme of things. Remember, MHC1 and 2 are on one side of the blood-brain barrier, and C4 is on the other. It turns out C4 is a third type of MHC molecule. This family of MHC molecule can be found on neurons in the central nervous system and can be used to target dendrites for removal or even entire neurons for pruning. However, T cytotoxic or T helper cells cannot be involved in this process since they are on the opposite side of the blood-brain barrier. And instead, we rely on the activity of another type of cell called microglia. We learned about these when we learned about the nervous system as a type of neuroglial cell, but in reality, they're a type of white blood cell that moved across the blood-brain barrier so that these cells could take up permanent residence in the brain and act as the macrophages there. C4 can be used to help target microglia to the proper places to remove dendrites or even entire neurons. We are learning that these cells are involved in a number of diseases that affect the central nervous system, not just schizophrenia, but also diseases like Alzheimer's disease and autism. And we're seeing evidence more and more that altered microglial function can speed up these neurodegenerative processes. And so now we think with too much pruning and too much microglial activity in the prefrontal cortex, this could lead to schizophrenia. And now knowing this, we could start designing drugs that might block or slow down the activity of microglia and therefore reduce diseases like Alzheimer's disease or possibly even prevent schizophrenia from arising in the first place and reducing the need for drugs throughout the rest of a person's life. And this is particularly exciting given that we do not have good treatments currently for schizophrenia. So there you have it. That's how a protein, C4, that's involved in the complement cascade out in our bloodstream might also be contributing to the progression of diseases like schizophrenia and possibly others like Alzheimer's disease and autism. So if you'd like to learn more, check out one of these fine publications I have listed here in my bibliography, and otherwise I will see you next month. Thank you for watching.